wherever you may be around the world. And thank you for joining us once again on truth to you.org. That's truth number two, letter you.org. I'm Jono. Joining me is Jason, spiritual babies of spiritualbabies.net. G'day, mate. Hello. I was, I was thinking, I'm going to say hello in Irish, but then it occurred to me that I can't remember what that is. <laughs> <laughs> It's probably something really e- easy as well. Are you talking I'll about Gaelic? Myself. Yeah, Gaelic. Yeah, because I'm, you know, I'm English, but I live, I lived in Ireland for like twelve years now, yeah. um, and I've picked up a bit. But um, man, it's such a stupid thing to forget. Yeah, I tell you what, I can still remember Ni Hao to, to all of our Chinese listeners. Thanks to Nehemia Gordon, the Truth to You China correspondent. Ni Hao, g'day, of course, uh, here in Australia, and joining us all the way from New York. OutreachJudaism.org is his website. Welcome back to the program, the underwater rabbi, Tobia Singer. Great to be here with you. Uh, great. To, what is good day, mate? See, from Brooklyn, any Jew is going, good day, mate. It sounds like everybody in Australia is, is on a boat, and they're moving by, and they're flashing their white cap. Good day, mate. <laughs> Nobody <laughs> in New York. He's saying it, first good, of all, you're saying it wrong. <laughs> no, you can't say good day, mate. It's not two words. It's one word. It's, con- it's, a, it's a contraction. It's good day. You only say the good. It's like it's like Yom Tov, but you would say Yatov. Yeah. Ah. How would you um if you were walking down the street and someone greeted you in Brooklyn, how would they uh, you know, nicely <laughs> how would they um how would they greet you? Well in the same way you would be greeted, you know, what does it feel like to hear the sound of gunfire? <laughs> well, how do you respond? <laughs> I See, remind you that I live in Ireland. <laughs> so, but I'm saying, but, but it's, uh, you know, if uh, you know in Brooklyn when they say the neighborhoods going downhill, we don't mean it literally. So it's different than Los Angeles. But it's a uh, it's it's a different environment. But there's no physical beauty in Brooklyn. But there's no that kind of cheery. I do not like I wrote an Encyclopedia of Brooklyn, but it's very different. <laughs> Okay. Hard to tell from my Queen's English accent that I sure. uh, I have a sausage place, <laughs> but it happens to be that's how it is. Good day to everybody in Queens, Brooklyn. Listen, yeah, we've absolutely. got uh, a a comment from Aaron Wynn. Aaron now Aaron brings us this week. He brings us the um, the the creature, the the feature creature, and uh, I want to know Rabbi Tobia Singer if you're familiar with this incredible creature. But he writes and he says, check out the pistol shrimp. Now, the pistol shrimp, he says it, uh, this one, like the one featured above. Now, he's referring to the one we did uh, a couple of weeks ago, photographed under the rock. The and mandis the, shrimp. Yeah. Mandis shrimp. Oh, the, the one that looks like a rainbow that, that does all the incredible things. What is it? Whips out its um, uh, a <laughs> 23. <laughs> what was that? What was that? <laughs> what was that? <laughs> Holy. <laughs> what was that? The world went crazy there. Did you hear that, Tovia? Yeah, but that's still pressing a button that one should not press. You... <laughs> was, that, was that you with some sort of special effects? Uh, Holy was, moly. Button. So you could just send me your medical bill. And I'll... <laughs> the that's... whips out its... <laughs> <laughs> whips out its claw at 23 meters a second or whatever it was. Something unbelievable. But this one creates, he says, creates a superheated air pocket, almost as hot as the surface of the sun. Now, I had to look yes. this up. Now, it's called the uh, Alphi, Al, okay, A-L-P-H-E-I-D-A-E, also called the snapping shrimp. I'm going to call it that, or the pistol shrimp. And uh, and apparently in, in um, uh, swarms of these things, the, the snapping sound that it makes uh, interferes with radars and stuff. In fact, it, it's attributed to the the, the greatest noisemaker in the ocean. Uh, it comes from these snapping shrimps. But the the thing about it, and I'm I'm just reading about it here, the snapping effect. It has a specialized claw uh, shut to create a, a cavitation bubble that generates acoustic pressures of up to 80 kPa at a distance of four centime- cent- centimeters from the claw. As it extends out from the claw, the bubble reaches speeds of 60 miles per hour or 97 kilometers per hour and releases a sound reaching, get this, 218 decibels. Holy moly. Do you know anything about this? Yeah, the mantis shrimp does this, a very similar thing. I didn't discuss this when I posted the, those images because it, we sort of, it gets too just so sort of overwhelm people with information. But yeah, the, the high speed, talking about Almost velo- velocity similar to that of a of a pistol. Uh, I have a handgun. Creates bubbles of air with intense heat that are spun by this extreme movement. Again, underwater things happen at a much higher rate. Movement has a much more striking effect. 
movement is more difficult underwater. That's why boats can't go nearly as fast as uh, cars and cars can't go nearly as fast as planes. So there's there's 26 times more density, and the, everything is spun up high. So therefore, the movement of 23 meters per second will spin a pocket of air into a heated state that actually will even, this is unbelievable, even with these creatures, when they shrimp, even if they miss the their prey, they, their claw doesn't bang it, the heat will kill the, their prey, which often is much larger than they are, which is mind-blowing. That but is... I didn't get that. But that's what happens. So even that's if they mind missed, blowing. Yeah. So I'm reading about it here. It says the snap can also produce. Now get this: sonoluminescence. I'm going to use that at a party next time. I, that's a great <laughs> word. Sonoluminescence from the uh, collapsing uh, cavitation bubble. As it collapses, the cavitation bubble reaches temperatures of over 5,000 K or, or 4,700 Celsius in comparison with the surface temperature of the sun. Mr. Spiritual Baby, listen to this: is estimated to be around. Five and a half thousand Celsius. So the, wow. <laughs> the shrimp generates four thousand seven hundred Celsius. Why doesn't it just burst into flames? I mean, I, I don't understand why. <laughs> I mean, in, in, in a whole in a whole um, swarm of these yeah. things, you think it'd be making the water boil, wouldn't it? What's going on? <laughs> <laughs> You've got all the answers. <laughs> they do. You, you know I, everything. You're a rabbi. I I know. I'll, the first time I ever encountered one, I didn't know what it was. I was uh, in Indonesia. I was a night dive, and I saw one. Uh, it was very colorful. I photographed, and then I went up, and then from the back of a digital camera, you could show it to others. And I and I had never been in this area. This area was near the Komodo Islands, and I showed it to you know, whoa, that's the Manta Shrimp. Manta Shrimp, whoa. So I had no idea that I was encountering a monster. It's a foot long, but I didn't know. Like I didn't know what I was up. Not, I would never touch anything. On the, I mean, like that, certainly mm -hmm. nasty. I might touch, you know, like a dolphin or something that goes by something large. I would never touch anything. But, yeah, it is scary to think that if I had, it could have blown my, my hand off. Not only, could off. Have, not only could have blown off some fingers, yeah. but it might, have, you might have, it might have incinerated you. Yeah, I, I had no idea. I had <laughs> no idea. But you don't touch anything. There are creatures, stonefish, you just don't touch anything. And it's very careful on the night dive. Especially, I'm very, very careful. Every, every diver on night dives be very careful not to swing your hands around. You know, the lights, we use lights to see and to help the cameras focus, attract or either these animals or attract its prey and therefore attract, draw, draw them in. So we do wear gloves. We keep everything covered. Uh, in some marine parks, they don't allow you to use gloves. The reason they don't let you use gloves is because they feel that if you have gloves on, that will make you feel more comfortable to touching corals and so on, which they don't want you to do. Mm. But what divers know is that these all kinds of creatures like jellyfish are in the water, which everything is eating is all over the place. So we dive in because the people are watching what you have. And once you're in the water, you put the gloves on because you just want to protect your hands from encountering this kind of organic yeah. material. Unbelievable. So that's Wild. the, that's the feature creature. And thank you to Aaron for bringing that one to our attention. Oh my goodness. <laughs> it just gets more and more amazing. Questions. We put it out to the listeners. Questions, Mr. Spiritual Babies. What, have you got one? We got a single one out here? Well, I have. Um, it might be a quick one. Um, Carly Shula asks, can women give blessings? In the Torah, it talks about men giving blessings. Mm -hmm. uh, is it appropriate for women to give blessings? I, I think that there is an, an, there are 613 commandments in the Bible and although we are given a mandate to praise Hashem and bless Hashem, uh, and we see in the book of Genesis in particular enormous emphasis on the blessings that were given by the patriarchs of, upon their children, this is not an ongoing commandment to, to seek blessings from other people in general. So we don't have, we have this in Genesis because what is really occurring, what obviously I know every listener is going is Genesis 48, 49, mm -hmm. the portion now swirling around us, uh, where Jacob is, you see, he's doing more than a blessing in this chapter. It's, it's superficially his blessing, but we know that he's looking at the ancestor of each of these tribes and using a unique language is telling us really about identifying features of this tribe. That's what's really happening there. So he is looking at Judah and clearly as a, a tribe that, that has been 
infused with, he'll, he'll give him the authority of leadership, and we see an enormous amount of, of blessing there. But it's really more than a blessing. It's really saying, this is the kind of character that you will have. We see a, a blessing, meaning this is a, a covenant that you will have, which Jacob sought after. But later on, did we we see this moving on in Scripture where we're told to do this? No, the, the priests of Aaron in, in Numbers are to bless the Jewish people, but to specifically go to your mother and father, although there is a tradition, this is not uh, this, is, this is not one of the 613 commandments. So it's just simply the forming of the royal family of Israel. I mean, mm -hmm. so the, I, I, that's why the, the question is born out of a, a language problem. These are really identifying features. We call them blessings, which are fine, but that's not really what's happening. What's really happening is we are shown what is the pro, what is the progenitor, what is the the people that emerge from a specific individual. What would they be like? What what kind of mandate mm. would they be given? So, what about uh, examples, uh, uh, Rabbi? Uh, for example, Genesis chapter thirty, verse thirteen. Uh, Leah says. Uh, I am happy for the daughters will call me blessed. So she called his name Asher. In, uh, I think it's, is it Judges chapter 5, Devorah, the judge, uh, the prophetess, uh, says, uh, sings the, uh, the song and, and she says, most blessed among women is Yael. Blessed is she among the women in tents. Things, things like that. Is that. What does that mean? Let's, let's, all we have to do is just do this one thing. What does that mean that someone is blessed? The word Baruch, Beirach, means to acknowledge. That means that somebody, some person, reflects back God, reflects back his sovereignty, his beauty. It's not us, it's not our, it's not our personality, but in some way, what do we seek to achieve as a child of God? Mm -hmm. The Torah says, be holy, for the Lord your God is holy. What does that mean? It could only mean one thing, and then everything falls into place. What we are called upon to do is to be a mirror or a foil to reflect back the truth, the beauty, the the exquisite qualities, and the the sovereignty and wisdom and love of the Almighty, our Rock and Redeemer, blessed is His holy name, Hashem. So therefore, not only our people can do this, Cities can do this, like Jerusalem in mm -hmm. Genesis, excuse me, in, in Je Jeremiah 33, verse I think, I think 16, where it says that Jerusalem we call the Lord our righteousness. Well, how can a city be Lord? Well, it means a city literally, when we enter Yushalayim, and you both know this, we feel Yushalayim in some way just sort of throws the light of God onto us. We feel something that we couldn't possibly describe, but we mm -hmm. know we are uh, an altar that Jacob would build is, is called God. Why would that be? Why do we have this language? So what we want to do really is we want to separate ourselves from a contemporaneous language of blessed means I have some power and you know what? I'm going to give that power to you. No. That's not, that would be a very pagan idea. That's what cannibalism comes from, the idea that we can eat another person's body and then take on their qualities. Very mm -hmm. the people, Cannibalism was very theological. It happened to Cook, who discovered, I think, uh, very important areas in the, in the oceanic part of the world where you are, um, who was ultimately eating right. cannibals. They weren't doing it because they wanted a meal. They did it because they wanted the powers that he possessed to in take them upon himself. They ate his body and drank his blood, literally. Mm. That's very theologically advanced. This is not barbaric at all. It's to us is repulsive. What Judaism is the opposite, says we don't want to take on the human features of a person, but we want we are seeking individuals. I can tell you something now that will blow your head off. Blow your head off. In the very famous and most one of the most argued over chapters is, is Isaiah chapter seven. Now, with 714 is the text, one of the 11 texts Matthew will use as a fulfillment citation to say that Jesus was born of a virgin because of what it says in Isaiah, the older virgin uh, will conceive. But that's how Matthew, it's a mistranslation. It's very interesting. That's Isaiah 714. Look carefully at Isaiah 710. I'm going to say that quickly because it'll give you a second to open your Bible quickly to Isaiah 710. Mm -hmm. The conversation, as this is, this is the prologue, which is setting up a conversation between Ahaz and Isaiah, 
over a civil war. Uh, Syria is allied with the northern kingdom against against the southern kingdom. Mm -hmm. What happened is the conversation between Ahaz, the king of Judah, and Isaiah, who's, incidentally, Ahaz is very wicked, Isaiah, of course, a very sacred prophet. In the conversation, Ahaz is basically trying to get out of this whole deal. He doesn't want to be part of God getting around the problem. He wants to escape. And if you look at verse 10, as Isaiah is responding to Ahaz's ridiculous display of false humility, he, it says there, what does the text say? Yeah, it says, moreover the Lord spoke again well, to go to the original hebrew it's yud yud hey right it's the end of name well wait god was speaking isaiah was speaking so the answer is isaiah as a became a, this is so blowing that that this is so mind expanding that means isaiah's little reflect he becomes the vessel of god he then reflects that back to achaz achaz was not having a prophetic experience with god he was nowhere he was a sinful he was a, a very wicked individual but the, so we baruch means let's just understand what these baruch means technically to acknowledge baruch means that when someone is blessed with devora where is introduced to us you say as a woman how could she be a judge a woman can't be a judge but omnushte anoshim witnesses have to be male judges have to be male how could she be ever a judge in israel on any kind of leadership position you know the devora is introduced to us is immediately the first thing i said that she was a prophetess she's the only yes. judge that's identified this way why is she introduced us as a woman as one of the pro as a prophet why because ordinarily this would not be a position for a woman we say why because a woman has a more important position and that is to be the leader of the home women normally can be bothered with this she has the role of proverbs 31 Sophia, the watch person over the home without her we're finished she doesn't she can't be involved with this she's wired completely different we three men know this completely a woman sees a baby they know exactly how to pick it up to hold it we're not sure what's going on so <laughs> But, her, but look at Devorah, she's introduced only one, doesn't mean there was no other prophet, but what is the foundation for holding a unusual role as a judge? Right away the prophet says, because she was a prophet, I mean she was imbued with prophecy and thus she was able to reflect back the master's, the master's brightness mm -hmm. and blessing. Uh, um, so um, what I'm sensing here is the definition of blessing now, from a, a, a Christian point of view, when you um, are a blessing to someone, you have done something or given them something that's um, lightened their life. And um, so I'm wondering if uh, Carla's question is, can women... So if she, if, if um, Carla's standing in front of her kids, um, I don't know if she's asking if, she can, if it's okay for a woman to bless those kids in some sort of prophetic way. I think she's maybe asking if it's okay for a woman to pray over the kids. Would that be, a, would that be fair, a fair yeah, of interpretation course. of the question? Yeah. Let's appeal to the Bible. Listen, my son, to the to the warnings of your father. Do not abandon. So beautiful, maybe. Do not abandon the Torah of your mother. What I'm saying, the term "bini," my son, my son, my son, in Proverbs, will come, I believe, 20 times. I don't have it in front of me, but there's more frequent, there's a more intense use of my son in Proverbs than any other book in the Bible. And even when uh, Shlomo, King Solomon's mother, is, is reprimanding her son, that's the context of Proverbs 31. People don't realize that. Uh, you know, the mother talking to him in Aramaic goes basically, what happened to you? Because King Solomon made some mistakes. Mm -hmm. And then King Solomon starts to soar with what is a right, proper relationship. Now, how do we, another example to prove this, it's not a transfer of my light to you. Mm -hmm. Let me show you something that's really quite exquisite. Going, appealing to Genesis, Genesis 12, 3. And the nations, God tells Abraham, mm -hmm. that are you, nations, and those who bless you, bless Meaning, blessing Israel, what will happen? They'll be blessed. Wow. Stop again. Do that again. Those who bless you shall be blessed. And who receives that blessing? So logically, if you stop right there and say, well, Israel gets the blessing. It's transferred from the Gentiles to Israel. No. It says there that if the Gentiles bless Israel, then God will bless the Gentiles. Israel doesn't get anything out of it. It's really quite marvelous. You notice the beneficiary of blessing Israel is not Israel. Mm. The beneficiary is those who are blessing. Israel gets nothing out of it. Israel has its own covenant. doesn't need it. Mm. There is, so the answer is yes there. there quite clearly, uh, women and men, everybody indeed should bless Israel. And in doing so, uh, God will bless you. And in all the families of the earth shall be blessed is what it says in Genesis right. 12, 3. Now, you did mention 
uh, Proverbs 31 and verse 28 just reminded me of that. Her children will rise up and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praises right. her. But you also mentioned, if we can move on from there, you mentioned just a couple of minutes ago, Jeremiah 33 verse 16. We actually have a question in regards to that. Can we, can we quickly do this? Yes, please. I don't know if this is going to be a quick one, but uh, this is from Shirley Gibson. Shirley says, in Jeremiah 23 verse 6, it says, In his days... Judah shall mm. be delivered, and Israel shall dwell secure. And this mm. is the name by which he shall be called the Lord. Our uh, the Lord is our vindicator. Uh, in Jeremiah thirty three sixteen, it says, "In those days, Judah shall be delivered, and Israel shall dwell secure." And this is what she shall be called: "The Lord is our vindicator." He and she from those two different verses. What's going on there? The answer is that we have. Uh, Jeremiah 23 verse 6 which is talking about the Mashiach and his name will be called the Lord our righteousness very striking and there are no shortage of Christians that are, are, are quite delighted to use this passage to mm. prove to illustrate that the Messiah is supposed to be divine. It's true that if you look at this passage uh, alone and there was no other passage in the Bible then one might be misled as one would be misled by any book that you went to chapter 23 on and went to the sixth passage in any book uh, either sacred or divine but once you look at the context meaning you look at all the surrounding passages namely Jeremiah 33 uh, what we find there is something that's irrevocable that Jerusalem is given the exact same name and that is the Lord of Righteous. what does that all mean now this is like so delicious because what's happening is this reverse back to what we said, oh, go, what is Jerusalem? How can a city be? The answer is we have all of us been to Jerusalem. We have sat there and feeling something that is intangible. I don't think any one of us could describe what, what that encounter is like when we are even driving up from the airport. And then we're going up, up altitude. Jerusalem is, what, about 2,700 feet above? And mm -hmm. then we see Bruch, oh, welcome. And then we, as we're getting into the old city, what are you feeling? You're feeling something. I wouldn't dare, any description that any of us or the listeners would dare attach to this experience would diminish from it. Can't. And then we get closer to the Temple Mount, and suddenly, pow, and there it is. It comes into view. Mm -hmm. And what happened? I can't. You know it. I know it. We can. We can. We can just well, it's say, an ah, overwhelming ah. sense of holiness, isn't it? Right, that's it. And it just brings you to your knees. It's, this city acts as a mirror in some way to reflect the divine, just as Isaiah did in his encounter with Ahaz. He reflected back God. He's called God. The Messiah would do the same, or else he's not worthy of the Mashiach. Mashiach could only be some person who we could look at his behavior and the way he conducts his life. And he, in a very special way, reflects back how God would behave, just as Isaiah did, just as others did. In fact, many of the greatest men in the Bible and women are, have God's name in it and, mm -hmm. and a description of God, Elijah, you know, and so on, all, this, all these names. That means that our role is to have a divine name and fulfill that divine name. Abraham did not have a divine a, a in his name, and he was given that because he imbued God. And then he, both he and his wife, their names had been expanded to, in order to reflect back that they were, in fact, mirroring Hashem, the Almighty. Okay, so the so the, the first reference, Jeremiah 23, verse 6, is in regards to Mashiach. The second reference, Jeremiah 33, verse 16, is in regards to the holy city of Jerusalem, is what you're saying. And there, yes. there's the difference in the he and the she. Uh, that's why that's there. Yeah, I mean, the, the pronoun is different because well, even though there's a lot of questions people can ask, the key point is, well, this is the language. I mean, what is Jeremiah really saying? What is he conveying to us? That in, in the Messianic age... There are certain things that go on in Jerusalem. You know, only 70% of restaurants in Jerusalem, this is a very... Uh, but 70% of Jerusalem's restaurants are kosher. 30% 30, 30 of the serving pork and lobsters in Jerusalem. Most people say, wow, that's terrible. That means what, Jerusalem could be better, could better reflect. It's again, going back to animals that we've damaged in the in the wild, mm. uh, in, in, the, in the oceans. We have done damage. What happened in the Messianic Age is, Everything takes on the precise role it was 
it, it, the mandate for which it was given. The mm-hmm. Jews, ten gels come to the heaven of a Jew and grab it and say, take us with you. Zechariah 23, 8.23, take us with you. God, we know is with you. That's really not just what's supposed to happen in the future. That's what's supposed to be going on all the time. The mm-hmm. Jew is supposed to be an mm-hmm. emblem for the Gentiles. If the Gentiles are messing up, the Jews are the ones who are primarily responsible for that. The Gentiles need to recognize that Hashem is using the Jewish people who are to be lawyers and doctors. No to be God's firstborn son and to reflect back that light. And that's Isaiah 60, arise and shine for your light has come. So that's what the Jew is supposed mm. to be. Absolutely. No, thank you so much for that. Rabbi Tobias Singer, again, it is uh, outreachjudaism.org. We're going to have to uh, draw the line there. Mr. Spiritual Babies, do you have anything to add? I'm just blown away. That was that was really wonderful. And There's so I much information. Wanna, yeah. I want to thank Tobias for his time and uh, you people for your questions uh, keep them coming keep them coming keep them coming leave them in the comment section and we will try to address them there's so many but we'll try and address them as we can thank you once again rabbi tobias singer outreachjudaism.org and until next week dear listeners be blessed and be set apart by the truth of our father's word Shalom.